Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Imagining America 2020 Collective Creative Engagement. I'm Trina Van Skindel, Membership Director at Imagining America, and I'm happy to be here today to introduce this session, Fostering Full Participation Through Democratically Engaged Assessment. This session is organized by the IA Collective, Assessing the Practices of Public Scholarship, or APPS, APPS seeks to bridge the gap between assessment as, a bureau, as bureaucratic management and assessment as a transformative process, one that involves all stakeholders in values-engaged exploration of the processes, relationships, and results of collaborative work. APPS is currently co-led by Julia Metzger and Sarah Stanlick, who helped bring together the multiple voices you'll be hearing from in the session today which include other APPS members, community partners, organizers, and friends. I'm really looking forward to their dialogue and storytelling around counter-normative, transformative, and radically inclusive assessment work. And with that brief introduction, I will turn the session over to Sarah. Thank you. So much, Trina. We're so, so thankful to be here and so excited to be talking with you all today. Um, we're going to get started and um, hopefully everybody will be kind to us with the technology. We're going to have a lot of voices, a lot of folks sharing, a lot of people in and out, which hopefully speaks to the dynamic of IA and the space to be creative with one another, um, but also technology. So please bear with us. Um, I'm going to just kick us off um, with our title slide here and hopefully you're all here for fostering full participation through democratically engaged assessment. Some of you may be already familiar with this concept, but what we're going to do today is we're going to definitely get into some of the, the basics, uh, talk a little bit more about some of the framing and some of the pieces um, that, that we've discussed with community members um, across the world at this point um, and, and we're bringing in to try and think about assessment differently. We're gonna share some wonderful stories from colleagues in their own words, um, and we're going to do some thinking together. So we're so grateful to have this time. And we're gonna start with this um, beautiful quote that our colleague Patty Clayton uh, surfaced for us from Sonia Renee Taylor. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and all of nature. So with that framing in mind, thinking about what was normal and what normal looked like and how painful normal could be for so many people, uh, we want to ask, if we aren't going back to normal, how do we imagine assessment and storytelling so that we don't renormalize the trauma, the pain, and the injustice of the past? And hopefully with this in mind, we can have some productive conversations today, both to lift up the examples of things being done non-normally um, in important ways, uh, and then also imagine what we could do differently in our daily practice and in the systems that we have some bit of influence of power in um, to change towards more, more just equitable assessment and storytelling. So with that, with that in mind, we're gonna ask you to participate in a small Padlet exercise. So we invite some thinking together on this. And we want to ask how can assessment be used as an agent of equity, justice, and healing? So you're gonna click on this link, hopefully, uh, down here at the bottom. It will send you to a page. It may give you a little bit of a gatekeeper page because it, because of the page. Um, so just click go on through and add your ideas. What are you thinking about in terms of assessment? It could be an adjective, it can be a complete thought, it's just some response to how can assessment be, uh, help us be able to move more equitable uh, and justice oriented uh, aims forward. So I ask you and invite you to take that moment. And as we do that, I'm gonna switch over to sharing the Padlet so we can see what pops up as we go. Not the correct thing. All right, so hopefully people are heading over here. I highlight again, that's the address. Yeah, 
And Julia so nicely has also put the address directly in uh, the chat so you can easily click on that. And we're starting to see some things pop up. So thank you so much. Okay, I have a Padlet newbie question. Yes. How do I add a sticky? How do I add one? So do right I just here, do it as, oh, okay. Yeah, there Got it. Is. Yeah, you. of course. Yeah, and I'll say that while we're here, please, at any point, if someone has a question and wants to pop in, we're trying to monitor the chat feature. We're gonna have a lot of interactive pieces to this. So don't hesitate. This is a space for us to enjoy for the next hour and a half together. Some good things. Talking about putting students, kind of being inclusive for students, student support, being aware that our stories can shift. Sometimes our stories are point in time, so it doesn't mean that forever or that you're describing a monolith, for instance. All right, and I see Joanna said, sorry, just joined, what are we doing? Um, we've got a Padlet uh, up. Please think about um, kind of how assessment hits with you, what you think about it, how it could be uh, used as a kind of a tool for justice and equity, anything that you would like to share. I'm going to give one more minute. And this link is solid, so if others have ideas as we go through it and want to throw something in here, please feel free to do that. Is the data even relevant anymore? I think that's a, a concern that we always have. How long do things stay relevant? Are they telling the story that we actually think they are? Are we just comfortable with them because they're numbers and they feel so concrete and tangible? learning together, reflecting together. I do wanna to zoom in on that point. It's a wonderful point. The idea of the collaborative effort that can come in around assessment when you're working together and you're getting really clear on the shared goals and objectives that you have together and having that discussion can be transformative in itself. I love the idea, Miriam, about moving slower, kind of being curious and compassionate, having an appreciative lens. So, you're all thinking about assessment in ways, I, I, I see a lot of hope in a lot of these answers and I'm really, really quite moved by that. So please feel free to continue to share the, the six word assessments. I'm gonna move back over to the PowerPoint so we can um, continue to move on. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm seeing in the, the answers and the responses, it does undergird our goals for today. So we do wanna share some thinking around a conceptual model for assessment. Democratically engaged assessment is something that can help us orient our assessment in ways that are more um, engaging, inclusive, that allow for full participation. We'd like to amplify some stories of founder target pilots that are doing work in transformative and inclusive ways. We're gonna engage you all, hopefully in some small breakout discussions and get a little bit deeper uh, about your own specific context and how it can be reimagined in your work. Uh, and then critically discussing the state of assessment, kind of where are we now? What is the world that we envision to hopefully get to and how can we make small strides in getting there? Um, so with that, I believe it is time for me to turn this over to my colleague, Mary Price. Hopefully Mary is unmuted. Yep. Hi everyone. How are you? Thank you. So let's um, just a, a placeholder for us to get started. So um, we posit that reimagining the practice of assessment in ways that leverage values that undergird democracy is a powerful way um, and a powerful act to engage the civic imagination. And that's unique to us in the arts, humanities, and design fields. It requires us to understand assessment as a cultural practice through which we can take seriously 
the demands of justice, equity, and civic courage, as Henry Giroux so aptly states. If we understand assessment as an imaginative act, not just a tyrannical act, then we can also recognize it to be always emerging, developing, reforming. We do not perfect our approaches to assessment so much as we practice it, along the way developing the skills and knowledge that are, as Giroux writes, central to democratic forms of education, engagement, and agency. So who are we? We're members of the Assessing the Practices of Public Scholarship um, research team that's sponsored by Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life. And we've been together for several years now. And together we're a collective of practitioner scholars working towards social change through service learning and community engagement. Some of us identify as artists and humanists, while others identify as higher education professionals wearing a mix of faculty, staff, and administrator hats. All of us see ourselves as members of multiple interacting communities where we have opportunities to act as change agents. What binds us are some common questions. How do we inquire into our work so as to better understand and improve it in ways that are more inclusive and which express our core commitments to community, to story, to the power of art, the humanities and design fields, to empower, inspire, inform. For us, part of the answer relies in reclaiming assessment. And the work we're doing together in DEA or democratically engaged assessment, we use the, the term assessment broadly. It encompasses any process of inquiry through which information is gathered to better understand, share, and improve our work. We find this approach to terms more inclusive and helpful. It, focus us, it fo focuses us to point to points of convergence rather than digging into distinctions among such terms as evaluation, research, and assessment. Throughout this discussion, use whichever term best speaks to your own experiences and ways of knowing. As you do, we invite you to be thinking about questions such as the following. When do you have a role in telling the story of your work um, or your organization? How and under what conditions does assessment feel empowering versus disempowering? What alternatives are open to you? When do you feel that assessment helps you bring the world you want to see into being? We as a group have been doing just this type of reflection ourselves, and we've been doing it with colleagues across a range of settings over five years. As part of that process, we've been collecting short six word stories from artists, public humanists, social scientists, activists, and others, just like you, about their lived experience with assessment, and particularly in the context of community engagement. We've collected dozens of these stories and wanted to share a few of them with you today, in addition to the ones you've already shared. See if you find your story in any of these. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, so, my friends, assessment is useful, complicating, power laden, exclusionary, an opportunity creativity, an exciting endless adventure towards understanding. Contentious, sometimes I say I'm overwhelmed and grumpy, help. We question, why are we measuring that? Oh, are we checking boxes? What is hard to measure and what we ought to measure are questions we continue to ask ourselves. To find the understanding of why to tell the story. And it makes me twitch a little. But big dreams, meaningful evaluation and reflection. And I know I am not here just to document and justify my own existence. I do this work because I care about contributing to change. You're gonna skip to one. <laughs> and here goes the technology. <laughs> and I'll hand it off to Patty. 
I'm Patty oh. right now. I'm just she, Stephanie Patty. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm yeah, probably Patty Stephanie. Um, but the uh, so we want to uh, invite you to think about assessment as a project of reclamation and a project of transformation, not technocracy. And um, this is ongoing and rooted in years of dialogue within Imagine America and a broader community of scholar practitioners and artist practitioners and uh, humanist practitioners. And so um, when we say we're reclaiming the term, we mean um, the ways in which we contribute to ongoing and iterative processes of co-collaborative, co-creation of meaning and, uh, and what counts and who counts and why is it counted, the inclusion of multiple voices and perspectives, so redefining what it means to be an expert, um, rethinking evidence, so qualitative, not merely quantitative, artistic, not merely positivistic, and cultural, not merely material. Um, it, it means engaging in shared inquiry processes needed to deepen our understandings and our relationships beyond uh, traditional power structures. And then um, broadening outcomes is the focus of assessment, not just outputs, to attend also to the processes and the relationships that, they're, that are at the heart of the change work, which is uh, um, rethinking uh, the results, processes, and relationship. That's what that um, picture is of. Um, so, um, so this is how we understand democratically engaged assessment and it says to read it, but I'm not going to do that because you guys can read it yourselves. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going off script. Um, but the, yes, so democratic civic engagement um, calls our attention to the inextricable links between democratic processes and democratic purposes. It seeks the public good with the public and not merely for the public and is therefore committed to inquiry and practice that is collaborative, inclusive, empowering of all stakeholders in the work of community engagement. It intentionally blurs the presumed lines between who is an expert and who is a lay person, between who produces knowledge and who consumes knowledge, um, positing instead that we are all both and that knowledge generation is a process of co-creation. Um, we, we live in worlds together and we co-create those worlds. And that community change that results from the co-creation of knowledge, not merely the dissemination of knowledge by academic experts or technocrats, is one of the one of the like activist orientations, if you will. As applied to assessment and community engagement, um, democratic civic engagement draws on the knowledge, expertise, experience, and perspectives of everyone involved in any particular partnership. So community members, students, faculty, staff. And it insists that all of those people have voices, have knowledge sets, and have capacities. Um, not only in identifying questions and goals and designing projects uh, of community engagement, but also in all the phases of assessment. Uh, democratic deliberation can lead to assessment efforts that are well informed as well as culturally and cognitively diverse with when the full range of perspectives is integrated and forms the basis of collective learning assessment is more apt to mo fulfill multiple goals solve more difficult problems and to generate new possibilities right. so I think hopefully what you're hearing here is that we do not uh, wish to prescribe a set of values that are uncontested or universal. We're not saying that this is a definite and this is the way to be. Um, but our many years of dialogue with scholar practitioners, with friends, with community members have led us to name kind of six interdependent values that compromise the heart of democratic community engagement and this DEA model. And so starting out with full participation, it references assessment processes that, borrowing from Susan Sturm, enable people, whatever their identity, background, or institutional position, to thrive, realize their capabilities, engage meaningfully, and contribute to the flourishing of others. 
So it demands us to question whether the full range of stakeholder perspectives are actually included, respected, valued, and supported. So if full participation is concerned with who participates in assessment, co-creation attends to how that assessment is undertaken. So our understanding of co-creation draws upon the Democratic Engagement White Paper by Saltmarsh, Hartley, and Clayton, 2009, pivotal piece, uh, which explains it as breaking down the distinctions between knowledge producers and knowledge consumers, which you heard in Stephanie's remarks. It manifests when collaborations are conducted with shared authority and shared power in all aspects of the relationship, from defining problems, choosing approaches, defining opportunities, addressing issues, and then developing the final products. So this leads us to ask whether participants working together are contributing equitably to all the phases of assessment. And then with regards to generativity, generativity is what creates the conditions for the emergence of new knowledge and practice. It opens up rather than closes down possibilities for reflection. It invites growth and transformation for individuals, organizations, communities, and generativity can manifest across any of the three key domains of assessment in the process, in the relationships, and the results, the triangle that we talked about uh, a little bit earlier. Um, so it suggests that we question whether assessment opens up new possibilities and documents unexpected outcomes. So if we talk about emergence, does it allow space for emergence? So the next in our wheel of values is rigor. Um, rigor in assessment talks about fidelity to methods, which could be new, could be challenging, that align with the purpose of inquiry as well as with its socio-cultural context. So the belief, beliefs, norms, and practices that are in play. It speaks to critical iterative examination of processes and of the meanings we make of results as well as to questions of ethics and concerns about avoiding harm. So rather than being about rigid adherence to a particular kind of disciplinary method, rigor instead asks us if this assessment inspires trustworthiness and confidence among all stakeholders. It's a shift, it's a shift we like. The next is practicability, which is our, for, our way of saying realism, practicability is grounded in the realities of the world as it is, cognizant of the power structures and the limits that we face, and also committed to navigating those challenges with an eye toward the world that we want to bring into being. Cousins Whitmore and Shula in 2012 emphasized that the realities of what is work in concert with what is believed and what is hoped to be in order to bring about collaborative inquiry and insights greater than the sum of their parts. To do this, we must ask whether assessment is feasible and whether resources are equitably and responsibly managed. Lastly, our last value is resilience. Resi resilience refers to adaptability to changing conditions. Flexibility in building capacities and durability of informed, critically reflective practices, all of which require nurturing relationships and processes of assessment that can withstand the inevitable pressures and disruptions from social forces, great and small. My, how that rings true right now. It demands we ask whether assessment is adaptable and durable enough to promote sustained learning. So these values undergird the work of democratically engaged assessment, but you might be asking how. Moving from the values to operation is always the challenge. How do we take these principles and put them into action? We do so by surfacing and challenging our held assumptions when we undertake assessment. Democratically engaged assessment is ultimately a mindset, a framework, an affirmation of the many ways of knowing and telling our stories. What it is not is a panacea or a prescription for assessment done right. It is well-placed questions that challenge us to do better at each phase of the assessment. Here, you will see operational model that surfaces the different choice points throughout the assessment process. 
It is at these junctures where we ask questions that realign the values and objectives of our work with the metrics and the data that we choose to analyze. At each of these junctures, we have the opportunity to evaluate alignment, assess gaps, and ask if, in the, if the way in which we are understanding our programs, our partnerships, and our products is authentic and values engaged. So over the past five years, we've gathered many examples of attempts to, do more, to move assessment in more democratic directions. And we've developed several concrete ways to practice DEA. One is a set of these questions that can be posed to assessment tools or instruments uh, to help determine the ways in which they do and do not enact kind of these principles of DEA. Call to mind any assessment tool that you currently use and ask, can it be uh, accessed by stakeholders? How transparent is it? Does it account for multiple ways of knowing? If you want, um, if, do you want to know, well, you will want to know, does it embody co-creation? Is there a range of perspectives that are included? Um, what is the extent to which it allows for collaboration? What are the processes through which it's refined over time? Do you have a generative space to be able to morph those assessments into things that are more uh, oriented towards values? So the DEA white paper posits a wide range of such questions to pose to tools and demonstrates their use across a variety of contexts to enhance the democratic nature of assessment. This is but one example of many ongoing efforts for the ever expanding community of practitioner scholars who are kind of examining DEA, putting it into their own context, challenging it, asking to morph it in different ways. Um, so we're trying to refine towards more specific concrete practices that bring this to life while also allowing for that emergent space to make it better and more authentic and more inclusive over time. So with that, we want to spend a little bit of time getting um, some questions from, from you all and to engage with any things um, that you're thinking as you heard this presentation. Do you have immediate concerns, thoughts, questions? And I would encourage, uh, please either speak up or um, feel free to chat. So I'm not seeing anything currently. I don't have any questions, but I do need to say that um, I'm almost crying here because I clearly have found my people and I had no idea. So hello, uh, you may not look us and my colleague Anne, pretty sure she's right here with me. So thank you. Excellent. And Kara, I have to say that your face is on my screen. So your reactions have been very <laughs> encouraging. <laughs> this so. is what happens when I go to women and often I turn my self view off so I can't see myself. So I assume no one else can see me. Um, you're not the first person to say that though. <laughs> it's important to have an expressive face. It really is. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and we felt that way as we've found each other, right? We have these moments and we're like, oh, there are people who are doing this differently. And it's not being pushed down upon by, you know, grant makers and foundational experts and things of that nature. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, Joanna has raised her hand. So, um, so this is great. And I've done a lot of work actually in Poland around the transformation and transition with the grassroots movements and uh, social movements and sort of citizens participation and how it has an impact on communities and so forth. So I was wondering if you guys are gonna share any examples of, of the work you did and because that's always good. I mean, that's the moment where you kind of get in. Yeah. The good words are good, but then they get applied into the particular context. And I think this is where the juices start flying sort of more. Yeah. Well, that might be a perfect segue into, we have five examples oh. um, that we've got collaborators who are going to share with us today. Um, if no other questions at the moment, and I'm not seeing any, maybe I'll turn it back over to Julia. 
Great, yes. So today we've invited some friends and collaborators and fellow imaginers to, into uh, this space that we share today to show us how they see assessment in their work, how they engage with the values of their communities, organizations, and selves, and what challenges they continue to face or have faced and how they have overcome them. We have um, five folks who are gonna be presenting today. We're going to do them in, in a little bit of bunches and then have some Q&A in between so you have a chance to ask some questions. So the first two will be Lashonda Crow Storm, who's an artist, community builder, activist, and urban farmer, and Joe Garcia from La Plazita Institute and University of New Mexico. Um, after that, we will see um, Stephanie Etheridge Woodson uh, from Arizona State University, and then Emily Morrison and Wendy Wagner will join us from George Washington University, and then we'll break for some questions again. And then we'll hear from um, Emily Cole and Brand Brandon Whitney. So I think with that, we can turn it over to LaShonda. Hello. Hello. Oh. I might be having a tech challenge. Hold on. <laughs> of course, it would happen just now. Can you see, can you all see the slideshow? Perfect. Yes. Okay. So, because uh, we just have a small bit of time, I'm going to uh, just kind of go through because I think questions are more interesting than just me because I can go on for hours. Uh, I work with Spirit in Place, that's, uh, which is a, at the School of liberal arts at IUPUI, which is Indiana University, Purdue University, located in the city of Indianapolis. And our strengths are rest in really using the arts, humanities, and religion. There are tools for how we uh, work to bring people together and build community. What's important about Spirit in Place is really understanding our community engagement principles. I'm actually the community engagement director for Spirit in Place, as well as all those other hats I wear in the community or scarves, because I usually have on a scarf. But what's really crucial to how we work is being people-centered in our engagement. And that really means uh, understanding that all the work we do is for people. And if people aren't there with us or the main goal for why we do the work, then we, we kind of in some ways have kind of already had an epic fail because we've forgotten that the work is about the people. Uh, it's about being adaptable and flexible because again, people are not monochromatic. So it means situations aren't monochromatic. Neighborhoods aren't monochromatic. Everything is different. The same two people coming from the same neighborhood from the same background have a different world perspective and we have to be adaptable and flexible if we are going to support this community. And it means that a lot of our work is rooted in capacity building and collective impact. And one way to think about how we define that is uh, that our goal to really transform community is figuring out how to weave the bonds of community together stronger. That a lot of that means that we have our hands on the pulse of so much of what's going on that we can see that what's going on over here in this neighborhood on the east side that, oh, here might be a really good partner for you over here. So why don't we just have a meet and greet? So we never, and that is important because at the root of so much of our work is really embracing emergence. We don't walk into these spaces with this goal of, we're going to get to this. We walk into this space and say, hey, we think you're doing good work they're doing good work, you're kind of similar, why don't we sit down and have a cup of coffee and have a conversation to see what we can create together? Because at the root of our work is always working with communities. So I'm going to just showcase two of the projects that we're working on now and how these principles about how we use the arts, humanities, religion, and centered these community engagement principles actually lead to some of um, what we consider tremendous outcomes. Powerful conversations. So again, our work, and this is one of the projects that was submitted to Imagine America last year was presented at it. Um, and it is actually called Powerful Conversations on Race. Uh, begin looking at all the things that happen with our communities, with our partners, working with the author of this book, uh, Keisha Blaine, um, did a presentation on campus. We were like, ha, ha, ha we see how this is an opportunity for us to help our own community find a way to move forward to have really difficult dialogues around race because it is necessary. So at this point, we are 
I want to say four years into the whole effort at this point, but it really is where we took humanities, connected that with co-creation and dialogue. All of these people here are important because none of that work would have been possible without all of these community facilitators who simply came to the table because they too believe that the power of using the arts, humanities, as well as dialogue was the key ingredient to how we began this process of transforming race in America. So again, uh, we had a lot of criteria for what it meant to be a facilitator because our community is, all, if you know anything about the Undoing Racism Initiative, Indianapolis is actually um, a satellite site because over 8,000 people here have been trained in undoing racism through our CASA department. So that didn't actually come through any academia. It didn't come through a race relation organization. It actually came through the foster care agency, which really wanted to look at how do they address issues around race to transform what happens to ch children as they enter the foster care or youth uh, criminal justice system. And because we have also participated in that, it made sense that we had a pool of people to pull from to begin this conversation of taking literally three tracks of our work, pull it together and see what happens. What became very important about the co-creation process is the thing you have to keep in mind about Spirit in Place. We are really only funded to the level of, at this time, one full-time position and two three-quarter time positions. And it is by cost we built those relationships for community that we're able to do lots more work than just literally two and a half positions could do on their own. And so again, from day one, that we brought the idea to the table to say, this is something we think we'd like to do. What should it look like? And community came with the facilitators to decide what that looks like. That became crucial because we work with a facilitation technique called civic reflection dialogue, which is about using source materials like history, historical documents, using art, using song, using music, using news articles, using all of these things as the root of the conversation and then the conversation grows from there. Well, technically civic reflection is uh, kind of designed for like 25, 30 people. Well, if you have the audacity to say we're gonna have a conversation about race at three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday and 88 people show up, our job is to figure out how to deal with that 88 people, not to just automatically be like, well, it only says we can have 25 because we had the audacity to say, we're gonna do conversations on race. These are not conversations that are uh, limited to who can participate. It is literally a general call out to community and whoever shows up, shows up. So thus, uh, lots of different skills about conflict resolution. Our very first dialogue uh, almost led to fisticuffs. So it wasn't us as spirit in place that decided what the next step was. It was us as all of the facilitators how do we manage the fact that we have 88 people? How do we manage in the future what may happen if this continues in a way that we may get violence? What do we do when we know white supremacists in the neighborhood have actually shown up to these conversations? And it was actually as a group that we figured out how to manage all of this. So over the 18 months of discussions, this was the final result that we found that um, literally <laughs> over 90% had a moderate to literally a great deal of change in how they understood race because these were monthly conversations that were quite intense. That we found that everyone in one form or another started to take action because a part of our discussions is not just to come in and have a chat, but to also offer lots of resources about various avenues in which people can take. Maybe you wanna to go to a different dialogue. Maybe you need to go uh, work with a, uh, a white, uh, white organization that just works with white people around race. But our job was to create the space for people to figure out the next step. Because one of the tricks about collective impact is knowing your lane. And our lane is very clear. How do we create the difficult space for what the community wants to happen find those partners to help it happen and find the resources because all of this is we offer free to the community and while we oftentimes are not allowed uh, able to pay the facilitators the payment is we do all the fundraising to pay for all of the training to be free and then their payback to community is to run a couple conversations so it's a really good trade-off we find the money you get the training you have a lifelong skill that you take back 
uh, into your communities. We actually found that individuals were taking, coming to the conversations and taking it back to their neighborhood associations. So they would come and work with us on Sunday to figure out how to do this dialogue, take the materials and resources that our facilitators had created and literally take it back into their churches, take it back into their mosques, take it back into their neighborhood associations. That where we are located in central Indiana, we found that we were the only one that was offering this. So we had people driving from other cities up to about three hours south of us to come to this conversation. So as we enter into uh, Powerful Conversations 2.0, which will launch in uh, January 2021, depending on what COVID continues to do to us, what those future tracks will be will be determined by what community discussed on the last day that they want to see move forward. And a part of that is also uh, doing a whole section that is just about racial healing, an entire section that just runs around whiteness. So those are looking at being anywhere from in a section that deals with Indiana history. So our responsibility has been to go get the resources to do train the trainer. Because every time we open a new track, we need anywhere from 12 to 24 trainers to run that track. We've also, uh, having worked with a different project that we were working on, we're about to take it on the road as we have two communities in the, city, in the state of Indiana that want us to work with them to help launch their own powerful conversations there. So what does it look like when um, we work with community? Because our work is really not just about the dialogues, but how do we reweave those bonds of community and make the fabric stronger? So here's just one of the organizations that we work with called Kepper Institute. We have an extremely multi if you want to look at it from a community uh, organizing point of view, we would consider them our base. And a base is every time you get ready to jump into off the cliff somewhere, you know you have a certain group of people that you can go to and say, hey, why don't you come along with us and see what happens? So Kepper Institute is one of our community partners that whenever we get ready to start something new, we go back to them because we know that they're very open. And we also know that because of how they raise their funding, that they have a certain level of freedom that some of our partners do not because they are a self-funded nonprofit because they have a for-profit arm uh, doing design work and websites and things that helps them be free from the funding cycle in a different way. This became important when we had our first effort with them. But again, our work with them is people-centered, co-creation always, but is extremely rooted in emergence is because this is what happened when we started one conversation here in 2016 with Kepra. And this all began because parts of the Cindy and Indianapolis are undergoing extreme gentrification. However, um, many community members and nonprofits will not talk about this because of the funding cycle and where they get their funding. As such, oops, Kepra was like, well, you know, we're okay with having that discussion because we're not tied to being afraid if our funding gets cut. So this one conversation, which was called Gentrify, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we spent an entire year exploring each month the different aspects of gentrification from how it impacts your food systems to how it impacts your education. What are the racial under components that lead to gentrification? What does disinvestment, equitable development mean? And so from this one event, it then led to an organize, a community event. Well, this was a discussion in 2016. It led to an event in our festival. That then during that festival, where we really wanted to explore what does it mean to bring people together and design a community plan that's all about people. That's what we did here uh, in this event called From the Ground Up. The people who participated said, well, you know, that's not enough. How do we keep coming together across sector, across city, and just keep having conversations? Kepra was like, I don't know, let's just do it and see what happens. So over time that led to five community assemblies, which a way you could think about is community task force. They did not like that language. So they named the community called it the community assemblies because they're like, we're not really tasked with anything. We're interested as citizens from across the city around these five central issues. From that, uh, then came this other event that the community created called the intersection, oops, Texas acting and doing its own thing. But again, from Gentrify, then came an entirely new year long discussion series where we then looked at, well, how has communities around the country and the world actually been able to create equitable spaces? And what does that look like? 
that then led to another discussion called creating the future. We actually uh, looked at what are the resources so people could build out some of these ideas. Well, because Kepra is Kepra, you can see here there, the yellow areas, their track and showing up every year in our festival. And each year they participated more and more. This is a different uh, tract up here called the Community Innovation Lab, where we worked for literally three years. It was two years of the, this part and then another year of execution, where uh, you look at how art and artistic processes themselves change, how you think about complex social issues. And the issue we were really looking at was how do we create eco uh, economic stability and sustainability for formerly incarcerated men and women, as well as uh, youth aging out of foster care, because the reality is whether we like it or not, those populations are viewed by our society as being disposable. And how do we create opportunities where you don't have to check a box and then that automatically removes you from economics? Because the thing about the arts is no one cares if you were in prison. And so how do we look at how the trade skills and all of those are different opportunities? Well, a part of this is that you do four experiments. Uh, one of the Kepra's particular experiments was around um, working directly with formerly incarcerated uh, artists to look at how do you support them to support their, their actual artistic careers. The work from here, from Gentrify, then collides with this project, which is, and it creates a new community art center. That art center literally opened in March 2020 and closed down March 13th, 2020, when our city went into uh, COVID. But it is because we continue to work with them in different ways, looking at how we could come together and think about transforming our own community that these whole tracks, which had nothing to do with each other, then led to something our community did need which was an art center for individuals who don't go through a traditional art program and they can do the work they need to do to get themselves on track in regards to having a professional art career. A different project here, uh, which we really dealt with how to use spiritual practices, traditional Yoruba, West African spiritual practices to support individuals with the grief associated with incarceration. Uh, one of our youth, uh, one thing that Indiana is really good at is actually um, dealing with women coming out of prison. We have lots of programs here that are really quite innovative. And one of them is Project Leah and another one is Belfound Farm. And that particular effort has led to that process of looking at grief as a vehicle for transformation to help people stabilize their lives moving forward being systematized uh, currently in the process of looking how to systematize that into both of those organizations program. So I could go on and on, <laughs> uh, but I think I probably already ran over time because I lost my, I lost my, my tracker here, but thank you. That was wonderful, LaShonda. Thank you so much. For well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to now transition over to Joe and uh, Joe Garcia from La Placita, community organizer, um, mentor, advisor, wonderful all around human is going to give some, um, some thoughts on, on his context of uh, how assessment intersects in storytelling. Um, so Joe, take as much time as you need and then we're gonna do Q&A after this first set. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, well, um, uh, this is um, in my experience um, at La Placita Institute in the uh, Albuquerque, South Valley. And I've been working there for uh, about 14 years. And uh, primarily my, my program is a, a huge uh, op open space. So 14 acre open space, uh, which is um, owned by Bernalillo County, which means the people own it. And, um, and it's managed by La Placita Institute, which we signed a lease agreement with the county to use that space for, for education and projects or educational projects as well. So <clears throat> we, we, you know, for, when, for past, um, you know, almost the whole time I've been there, we, we've been using, um, We've been using old-fashioned clipboards for you know '70s style. You know, is you know I, I think it, it's it's um, 
um, something that we experienced, you know, but we had nothing else because we were a nonprofit just starting up and have no money. Lucky we had a $5,000 grant, you know, and some months would be with no pay and some months would be with pay. And um, I remember the holidays being the ones that had no pay, which was really tough. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that's what we we're doing. We we're doing the work. And we we're also trying to collect data and trying to, um, you know, be able to collect enough to show that we're actually viable and that we're, we're uh, you know, an up and coming organization. Uh, and, you know, just all with the grant writing and through the foundations and stuff. And we we're trying to put something together, but we were just so young and, and so broke, there was nothing to put together, you know? So, so we, we sort of, sort of just like, you know, survived and we, we thrived and we thrived because we had spirit. Uh, we didn't have no money, but we had spirit. And that is the most power that you can ever have, you know, in the universe. So, cause it is the universe. And so, um, we continued on and we persevered and um, I've been working at the same space for, for, for the whole time, you know, it's been my project. Um, and so we were collecting, you know, all the demographics, you know, for the foundations, uh, which we still do, uh, but age, sex, school, organization, name, contact information, um, you know, what, what organization is visiting, how many people, you know, so we're, we're, um, really doing our best to document that way. But I, I, I found that something was um, just, it, it didn't feel like it was contributing to our evolution as, as an organization or even as a staff member in the organization. Felt like we were trying to keep up with something um, because it was required. And it was something that gave us hope that one day we can submit this this, these numbers and this, this, this data to uh, these foundations and maybe they'll value our work. You know, maybe they'll see some potential in our growth and, and want to stand behind us, you know? And so we were, we were doing something, you know, that, that was um, extra work, you know, because we're, we're like trying to get people there. We're working with the people that were there and we're like, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the soil, as they say, you know, the, really getting our hands in, 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 you know, and, and so all this other stuff was like, almost like, you know, it's like, it's it almost considered like fluff, but except at the same time, we knew it wasn't fluff. It was it, it, because the foundations needed it. They were asking for it. And, um, and so we, we had to, we had to learn about data collecting, learn what, what, how we could do it. But the technology we had was pen and clipboard. 70s style clipboard. <laughs> I always remember, I, I always made, made me feel like I was canvassing for Greenpeace, you know, uh, with a clipboard, you know, just, uh, <laughs> and then asking people to sign it every week over and over and over again, you know, if they come, you know, more than once, then it might be the same people. What about if they're, if you can't read their, their, their signature, their handwriting? What about, you know, what about if there's more uh, than one person with the same name? You know, then you got to distinguish them by the address or other demographics that you know try to separate separate them out. You know, because we do have um, people with the same name. So that you know, that, and who's going to count all those sheets of the, the clipboards, right? And uh, that we were getting from the clipboard. You know, it was all individual sheets. It was uh, who's going to do that when we had real work to do, as we considered it. Um, so, anyways, uh, fast forward. Um, it's it's now we're we're starting to um, uh, take advantage of the digital age, so now um, we are go now working with a new um, sort of a it's a consultant but it it's called Pivot and um, they are, are are helping us with a new strategy for collecting data uh, and that means uh, we're going to collect the same data as before that the foundations uh, like. And required, uh, but this time it's going to be where each program at La Placita is going to have uh, their own notebook and an app, uh, an app that would that would people would be able to uh, enter their information and all that kind of stuff only once, and then after that this app would t would you know would would keep track of, of that information and it would there would be no way of mixing people up, you know, and then those that information on a spreadsheet. Or it could also be transferred into like um, infographics, uh, uh, charts, and and and, um, and you know any kind of uh, 
of, of, of way that you want to look at tables and stuff that you can print it out on. And so that's a whole lot more easier than counting uh, how many papers come from this clipboard. So, so we're, we're actually just, just starting that up. So uh, maybe next time I can give an update on how successful that has been and how easy it's been. And it also makes it easier for annual report. You know, when people want to say, you know, what's the annual report? Total, total things. Everything just sort of just comes out and everything's total for you instead of having to like, you know, do it with a calculator the old school way. Um, so I think that's, that's more, much more fluid and more um, towards the flow of our evolution as an organization and just uh, logistically easier as, as, as individual people, staff. Um, so that's where we're at now as far as data collecting. The way that I measure it, you know, from my experience and in my opinion of working there, um, is very little to do with all the data I just mentioned that we are now collecting. So um, the way I see it is is that we're we're um, adding to that data uh, the, the 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 visitors' interest and potential. Uh, so are they, are they interested in volunteering? Are they going to, you know, would, are they, would they be interested in volunteering with us, you know, uh, after school or, you know, after work? Um, do they have any ideas for potential projects, uh, proposals, ideas, you know, you, their creativity of the community of all the students who come? Um, proposals of art, music, and all the humanities in diverse expressions. And they can build them and display them and grow them throughout the 14 acre learning space. So it's, it's creating an intentional space for creativity to, to express itself. And uh, that has led over time to create uh, this 14 acres open space. When I first started, it was a very sketchy place, a very dangerous looking sp space that, you know, maybe you might not want to go back there. You know, it, it, it's, it's abandoned, you know, there's like wild dogs there, you know, somebody might jump out of the bushes, you know, and now because of um, all these proposals and the art that students have done and, you know, really just beautifying the space, uh, welcoming the people, giving this welcome feeling, uh, we sort of, we, we, we were actually instrumental in, in transforming the space, you know, um, and, and, and now people feel welcome. There's a lot of dog walkers and there's a lot of joggers and, and people getting exercise. Um, we've also had uh, two weddings there so far, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's the evidence of the energy um, as, as the assessment, you know, use the energy as, as a, or vibe as everything, um, since everything is energy and use it as, as an assessment tool of intuition. You know, and, and that sort of like translates into stories, into more projects, and sort of has this exponential growth of positive and uh, positivity and beauty um, that are beyond the measurements of, of, of statistics, um, at least in, in, in this way, in the, in the qualitative way. Um, but, you know, also words and stories, you know, as, as community reviews. Uh, you know, what are people saying about the place? You know, I mean, you can have all the numbers in the world that show you all this kind of indicators of success, but then, you know, it's like, well, you know, do, are, are, they, are they only there because they have to be there? You know, were they sent there for some reason? You know, there was, you know, some, some court, you know, uh, requirement or, you know, their parents make them, making them do it, whatever, you know, it's like, well, the, the real assessment and who, who wants to be there you know, and do they continue coming, you know, even after they don't have to come anymore? Because we work with kids on probation and some are um, required to be with us, you know, instead of going to jail. Um, but they hang out with us in the daytime, you know, and, and then we release them to their parents. But then also um, after their, their um, uh, you know, their time is over with, they're mandated by the court to be with us they continue to come and hang out with us and they and they bring their creative projects to the space and they, they cook for people and they serve people and they become uh, teachers, you know, and, 
you know, we have a guy that came out of prison and learned ceramics in prison. Now he teaches uh, ceramics by, because he created his own uh, program, ceramics program, uh, and now works with the kids on probation. Um, so all, all these things are about, you know, trust um, and, and, and relationships, you know, as a family, it becomes more of, is your family growing? You're doing something right. Family's not growing, or you know, people don't want to go there. Well, that's tell, those are indicators of maybe we got to re, 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 reevaluate, you know, uh, of how we're what we're sending out. You know, it's the communication model of sending and receiving, you know, and everything is energy. So I, I really use um, uh, how, how, the vibe of how people come and, and, and interact with us uh, as an organization from the community of people we've known for years and, and people that can hardly wait to come back, you know. Um, and, and I, I just really feel like that is, is the way that I use the term in, uh, assessment of, am I doing, am I doing the right things uh, as, a, as a staff member? Are we as an organization uh, making people feel welcome? You know, and so th that, that's what I use personally. Um, I just wanted to share that there's a, a letter that posted it here uh, from a, um, a former student. Uh, and I just wanna invite you guys to read that and, and then, um, that sort of speaks for itself. Um, but it, that, that's, that's an example of the assessment I, I'm referring to. getting a lot of wonderful comments, questions, and feedback in the chat window. And I'm, I'm so very grateful um, for your time. Um, Joe, I did see that somebody had a direct question for you about what you replaced the sheets with. And just remind us of that, that they missed it. Okay, uh, yeah, that, those sheets are now on the, uh, the app that I That's mentioned right. that were created so that we entered, we have still have, we're still providing that information. Um, that, that they want, but I'm just sort of like adding my own um, additional ways of assessment um, that I've experienced throughout the time that I've been there. And also I, I wanted to mention that what I've, what I've shared is it's hard to gather unless you have been there uh, in the organization long enough to see the fruits of, 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 of the things that you grew to come back. And now, um, you know, as the teacher here, Andrew, has done. I mean, I it's, it was like a real uh, a beautiful thing, you know, for this guy to come up driving up in a motorcycle and say, "Hey, you know, I'm Andrew. I was one of the students in the class, and now I'm a teacher around the corner, and I'm I, I want to ask you if I can bring my class to the garden, and and so they can experience some of the things that you guys shared with me, you know. And so it goes full circle. It's the region. It's like the impact of regeneration you know you're, you're you're measuring that because that's like the thing that's like creating uh new forms and uh, diverse forms but but it, but new life you know and um and so i i just wanted in my opinion and experience andrew came back to where it all started for him uh, as a student but now has returned as a teacher who wanted to share and co-create the opportunity for learning for his students in, this, in the same place, uh, that's where I refer to the regenerative energy uh, of giving and receiving. And, um, and it requires uh, being in the learning space long enough or staying in touch with students. Um, and, and sort of like, you know, but then it's sort of like, I don't know if it's sort of like uh, influences the, uh, uh, you know, the, you're sort of influencing them if you're sort of like, keeping track of them, then it's like, well, they're going to, they might say, you know, uh, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And they're really not, you know, so it's sort of hard. And then you're, you're, um, sorry about the phone call, I guess. Um, but your, but your, your impact may stay an unknown, you know, it, it may stay an unknown as you, as you plant as you plant seeds, you never know uh, the germination rate, you know? And so some of the things, some of the, th some of the great teachings that you guys are sharing with your students, um, you'll, you'll never know what, what may germinate in their life throughout their life, you know, two years, five years, you know? Um, but you planted that seed and, um, 
you know, unlike plants, humans move around. So it's, it's, it's only normal that that happens, but, but it, it really gives me like, I don't know what the probability or the percentage of, of that would be, you know, um, but I think a lot of, a lot of people are, are, um, they remember us, you know, as educators, they remember us, even if we don't, you know, have any evidence of that, you know, just like we remember some people that we haven't talked to in so many years, you know, um, that they influenced us. So I wish there was a way to measure that and, and you know, and use it in research. Uh, but I feel like that's, you know, that's what like Ariana Huffington, you know, says, you know, to USC Annenberg uh, journalism students, um, you know, focus on what's working, report on that, put your energy, time, and money behind what's working instead of uh, focusing on the dysfunction and what's not working. I think that's where we're going in circles. And, you know, we're just using the same thing. Or we're, we're sort of like spinning our wheels and really um, not putting our money with behind things um, as a people, you know, what is working. Because, uh, you know, if, if, if we at La Placita would have had funding from the beginning, uh, imagine that. But, you know, no one knew. No one, no one knew what we were doing and, and no one even knew we existed. So, you know, that's sort of like the, the learning curve, you know, and the survival curve. I mean, can you survive that? you know, to, to be able to, to bear fruit, as they say. Um, so thank you so much for allowing me to, to share. Thank you so much, Joe. I, I so appreciate it. I'm realizing our time, we're only, we only have about 24 minutes left and we've got a few more folks um, who are gonna present. So I think what we're gonna do is we're going to have everybody do the rest of their presentations. Please keep up the great question and answer and the vibrant discussion that's happening in the chat because that usually doesn't happen. So since it is happening, let's push that there and keep talking with one another. And I will uh, invite Stephanie to, to present now. She, she's ready. I'll stop sharing the screen. Hi. Um, uh, so I direct what is called the Design and Arts Corps, which is uh, the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts Initiative to partner all of our students with community partners um, to intentionally make the world a better place. Uh, so I am going to share my screen really fast. Um, one of our primary, so the first thing I wanna share with you is um, just our website. So, and I'll put this in the chat if you want to, but you can find out all sorts of information about us, including how we're going about teaching and what our um, what our model is, what our principles are. Um, and you can actually um, you can actually look at the modules if you want. You have access to them. We have placed them out for community partners um, and anyone. And we're we make the modules with the community partners. But what I want to particularly share with you is um, is a tool we've developed. So democracy, um, participatory democracy is, is a fundamental principle. And um, the over the years as we've worked with students, we have noticed that uh, a, a, a robust understanding of democracy beyond politics, we're not interested in politics, we're, uh, or political understandings, we're interested in democracy as as a experience of being in the world together and as a process, as a, a set of performance practices. And so we're trying to um, kind of frame our work through that uh, at the same time, recognizing that we're a public institution and we are a democracy maker space within the political framework, right? We, we have to have tools and techniques to be able to dialogue and to see how um, we, we can work together in collaborative um, ways to uh, not, so many things are bad. Uh, how are we focusing on the things that are working? So we developed this tool and I'm just gonna show it to you um, to help students assess how they are using participatory democracy as a, as a way of being, particularly in their in their in the projects that they're doing, but also in in the wider variety of their experiences. And so, the the ways in which we have framed this, uh, first of all, we use the traditional um, 
UN understanding of democracy and the health of a democracy, where they divide it into uh, depth, breadth, and range to get at the, at the, the diversity and um, um, particular circumstances of how people are being engaged in what kinds of decision making and at what points in the decision making. And then we have uh, divided it into before a project, during a project, and then after a project. And this is a set of questions um, that we understand as a way of focusing um, everybody involved in, uh, in coming back to collaboratively. Who's making decisions? What kinds of decisions are being made? At what are the numbers of people impacted by decisions who participate in those decisions? And uh, it's been some interesting to see the way <laughs> we, um, we have them apply this first to the way that their classes work. And, um, and uh, we are, we understand higher education to be a, a spot of democracy, but it is not, <laughs> it is not a democratic space. Um, anyway, if you want a copy of this, you can email me and I'll send it to you and I'd be interested to hear feedback. Feedback is love. Um, here is the website. Nope. What did I just, I, I, I'm, I will post the website in the chat and then my email address. There's the website, here's my address, if you want it. It's a PDF. So, thank you. Oops. Yeah. Thank you so much. I believe Wendy and Emily from George Washington are up next. Hi everyone, it's so great to see familiar faces and meet some new people also. Um, I agree that it's, it's so valuable for us to find each other. Um, so Emily and I are at George Washington University. My role there is the Director of Community Engaged Scholarship in the Honey W. Nashman Center for Civic Engagement and Public Service. So my role is, is faculty development and supporting engaged faculty. And so uh, like a lot of other centers like ours, we use um, one faculty development format called the Faculty Learning Community, um, where small groups of faculty from across disciplines meet regularly on a topic. Uh, it helps us go deeper in conversations than you can in a one-off workshop. And it also makes the relationships between faculty who usually haven't met each other before because they're, they're in different departments. But those, those relationships create a great social support <laughs> for folks who are doing co community-engaged work when others in their department really don't get what it is they're trying to do. So, um, so for the year 2020, we introduced a, an FLC on democratically engaged assessment. So we meet monthly. Um, we've discussed readings, um, and particularly, of course, the DEA white paper. Um, the stroke of genius, <laughs> which was mine, is that we decided to bring Patty Clayton in <laughs> to our FLC um, as an external facilitator, and it's been wonderful. So she videos in, even before COVID, the idea would be was that she would video in for our monthly meetings, and she's brought in some great um, discussion points. She gave great overviews of the of the DEA mindset, um, but also activities for us to do in between meetings so we can maximize the time that we spend um, talking about new ideas to share and talking about where we sort of see blocks where we're not sure how certain parts of this will work in our discipline or in our context. Um, the faculty that are in that group are a good range of people that have been great to, to hear how this plays out in a very different context than each other's. So we've got a writing faculty member. We've got a couple of folks from public health. Um, Emily Morrison's here today. She's with human services and social justice. Um, we have an art therapy person, anthropology, nursing, school of medicine. Um, and we have one person who is GW's director of co-curricular service learning programs. It's been great to have his perspective and, and the partnerships that he has. Um, so it's been, it's been really great. And, and having those different contexts has really helped all of us sort of deepen our understanding of, of what this looks like. Um, and it's also been great because people have been bringing in literature from their own disciplines that some of the others of us hadn't. And it's all kind of the same idea, but articulated just differently enough that it makes you think. So I'll give one example. The writing professor brought in Rachel Shaw's um, Rewriting Partnerships, which just came out. Um, and we, so we read it over the summer. That was our read for the summer. And it, it's really, really good. But <laughs> being from 
the writing discipline. It's not something I probably would have come across until much later. So that was great. Um, in terms of the progress we're making, we're in the middle of the FLC year now. And our original plan was to spend last semester learning all about it, trying to like think through what it would look like in our context. And then each of us start working on implementing some real projects in the fall semester. And so we were envisioning by fall, we'll have community partners, some students, other voices to join our meetings as some of these projects get started. But then campus closed, physical distancing. My faculty were drowning, converting their courses to distance learning. The community partners in DC were doing, meeting a lot more need with a lot fewer resources. Their staffs were cut. So it just interrupted all of our plans. Um, Will, um, who is our co-curricular programs director, really sort of articulated it the best to sort of say like most of what we all wanted to look at was examining the quality of our partnerships and relationships and those are all constantly in flux right now like we're we're serving from a distance we're changing direct service to virtual service we're shifting to indirect service where you know and who knows if in spring semester we'll be back in person or not we just learned today that gw is doing virtual classes in the spring semester so trying to assess relationships when the relationships are so different um, while everybody is also busier than normal just sort of threw a wrench into everything but we're so we're continuing to meet this semester and just continuing to learn and to try to hear from some other voices the way that we had anticipated we would um, by bringing in some guest speakers so um, there's even some people on this meeting that we had planned to call to say, would you come and guest speak to our FLC to talk about your study on our campus? So some of you might be getting some calls from me later. Um, so so I, we do have some outcomes that we wanted to talk about because it's a good example of just how differently this is playing out for different folks. So I think Emily is going to jump in and talk about some and then I'll talk about some. That's great. So I think the main thing is, and, and like I think most probably here that are in this session, you know, when we start out with our partnerships, there's a lot of intentional conversation and meetings and, and over time, um, having been at GW for a while, what's interesting is sometimes community partners change and so is the relationship with that person or is it with the organization and so i really appreciate like the dea and the in the white paper because it refreshes that thinking of like wait a second what have i taken for granted or assumed and so being able to be in this community and, and have kind of that critical reflection on ourselves and and our partnerships and engaging in how can we actually um maximize this potential that we have and working together and to be able to tap into that and to make something that might have become static it's the same eval we've been using for the last three years um we developed it together but it doesn't account for all the emergence and change and so as a faculty member individually there are a few community partners that we can kind of pilot and say all right we may not be able to do it the same way that we were thinking or had talked about earlier but are there ways that we can start to kind of tap into some of these questions or even in some of the student evaluations of their work, beginning to ask a few questions that can help us as we then plan for the spring and for next year um, in terms of are we achieving, you know, these kind of aims and outcomes that we're hoping to do. And so it also shifts some of what the products are. So, for example, in our introduction to human services class, students were doing individual interviews with older adults throughout the city to learn about the experience of well-being. And that data was then given to the community partners, shared with community members, presented at the City Council on Aging. So the students had some different opportunities. And now that we've done that, it's also, wait a second, the deliverable needs to change. You know, asking the same older adults to participate over and over doesn't serve the community. And so it's also then being able to be flexible enough as a faculty member to adjust what those projects are and that this process um, makes teaching much more engaging because it's constantly kind of adapting and embodying what we're hoping to do but it's also meant learning some new things myself so one of the things that came out of it was digital storytelling was a lot more effective are there websites that can bring in and show kind of what the students are learning that could be accessed later not just in terms of this 
one academic kind of paper. So it's met in engaging in these dialogues that it's changed and challenged kind of what I was thinking is what would be a useful scholarly product. So having the space to do that, sorry, that's my, I have class in 10 minutes of morning, so I'll be super quick. The other is about community-based um, participatory research. And again, public health is doing a whole lot of, um, with this on our campus as well, but really thinking about how are we designing and, and making that um, intentional throughout in terms of some of the outcomes and what our partners need. So it isn't just a scholarly product, but that it's also something that's of use. So for example, in one of my classes, we're doing um, oral histories on national service and trying to help build um, and connect with efforts that are at IUPUI and Stanford and the corporation, et cetera, to link stories. So Wendy, I'll let you, I know we've got one more that we wanted to add in. Mm -hmm. Um, so another project that emerged is um, through Phyllis Ryder, who is the writing professor, um, who's on the FLC. Um, she has been a really, really great community engaged faculty member for a long time and has written a book even about her experiences engaging students with the community related to writing. Um, and she has just come off sabbatical. She spent her sabbatical studying anti-racist writing assessment, which is something that the writing community has been talking about a lot. And now when she came back from all, being steeped in all that literature and then she came back to the FLC conversations over the summer, she was just you know, weaving all of these pieces together. So now she's um, working on a DEA project with two local organizations that she has worked with for years, connecting her first year writing students to. Um, and the outcome of that has already been accepted to be presented at the Conference on College Composition and Communication, which is this April. Um, but the main piece of that being, we have this call for writing assessment that will be, um, you know, in include a broader perspective on what great writing is. Um, but then holding over here, if we're doing community engaged writing courses, then what is the role of our community partners in having some say in what great writing looks like. And when we're designing those standards, um, what should their role be in, in working to co-create those courses and those writing outcomes? So um, we're looking forward to that. And so the group is kind of helping her navigate the meetings with her students and with community partners and other um, writing faculty in her department. So that's, that's coming together really cool. The other piece that I might add in right there is one of those organizations that Phyllis is working with, like Pieces to Masterpieces, is also an organization that I work with in one of my classes on interpersonal relationships. And so also beginning to recognize the overlap between as faculty and what does that mean for our community partners. So kind of the next stages are how do we all kind of come together, not only within a particular program, but as faculty, even within GW and our stakeholders and Wendy and Will and um, the National Center but really coming together as a larger group. And some of that has been hindered by, you know, kind of the virtual state of things right now, but that's where we're trying to go as well. So can we have some individual kind of pilot successes or hopefully successes with this and then collectively learn from one another to develop it more intentionally um, as a university, but even as faculty within that. So really appreciated the other examples of how y'all are making it happen, thank you. And then the last piece is my project that I've been, as a member of the FLC also, um, what I've been looking at are a, a few emerging partnerships that we, we don't have the relationships with community organizations now for some new initiatives we would like to launch. So I've really been looking at using the DEA framework at the beginning of those relationships to sort of introduce the concept, the values behind it as a way of introducing community organizations and, and community members to these values as a way to articulate those values to them. So we can start at the beginning of the initiative to say, well, here's, let's art articulate our, our shared goals and outcomes for this in terms of our relationship, in terms of the results, in terms of our process um, and do that from the beginning. Um, so that then that assessment process really is a cycle and that's sort of a, well, we should have thought of this at the beginning, but how can we retrospectively get some assessment data on this initiative? So um, more to come on that. I have two initiatives that are launching this semester um, that are going to be going to be using DEA to, to form the agenda of the first meeting. So more to come. 
Fantastic. And I just posted in the in the chat that we are going to host another discussion later this month. So if folks want to pop in their email address to sign up, we can continue the conversation because there's been so much uh, robust discussion today. And we've got two more folks we want to hear from and then close. So if people are okay to spend another couple of minutes with us, we're so appreciative of your time. I'm going to kick it over to Emily Cole. Hey everyone, um, I'll be really quick. I just need to share that um, I'm at a small liberal arts institution and our community-based learning program was brand new in 2018. We spent the first two years of our existence formulating the curriculum and we did so alongside a group of faculty and community partners. So we have a designation criteria, you know, the, the elements that are expected to be present in your course, the student learning outcomes, um, but what makes that interesting in our context is that those ideas were co-developed with community partners and faculty at the table with us. Um, so we're at the point now where we're trying to figure out what the heck to do with those learning outcomes and assess uh, the extent to which they are successful or need some tweaking. Um, so to that end, I joined a higher education certification and assessment program. Um, so in some ways, I was familiar with DEA in theory before I was familiar with the more traditional technocratic ways of doing assessment in higher education. The one thought I want to share with you all is just a note of hope. Um, the deeper I get into that literature and the more I learn from my faculty, uh, the more alignment I find between the way we talk about what matters in assessment and what they talk about as important in assessment. Um, there will always be bean counters, no offense bean counters, uh, but I'm really excited to find that the majority of assessment practitioners and scholars consider themselves to also be in an emergent field and they care about the rigor and the integrity of their work and they don't wanna be bean counters. They, they're looking for inclusive ways of pushing the conversation forward and you know, continual improvement efforts. So that's not necessarily something I was expecting since I had already labeled this like a technocratic discipline and you know, felt the resistance. Turns out they're as disappointed in the resistance um, as we are. <laughs> so I'm excited to see where that leads. Thank you so much, Emily. That was fantastic. We really appreciate it. All right. And so a few thoughts also from Brandon, if you're here, Brandon. Oh, great to see your face. Hi, Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, until uh, this summer, um, I was a co-founder and COO of an organization called IOBI, stands for In Our Backyards. I think I just put the URL um, in the chat. Um, we're a, a civic participation platform that, that uses crowdfunding for um, like local community projects to sort of drive civic engagements. So we've worked with um, almost 3,000 uh, projects across the country. We have sort of community organizer staff on the ground in a number of cities um, and and residents and local leaders have raised, I think, over eleven million dollars. I didn't check the last uh, stats before before I jumped on, but um, I left the organization after about a decade of it being my full time job and twelve years um, with it overall. And I just wanted to say that, um, from sort of a non academy perspective, at, as a community organization inside of uh, foundation funded kind of landscape, the the technocratic approach to in, to to assessment um, that's pushed particularly through like theory of change stuff was something that we fought against or rubbed up against with some amount of friction um, for many years and I just wanted to um, thank this community for continuing to have these kinds of conversations. Over that time, I was able to pull all kinds of cool ideas from the apps and the DEA folks um, out of sort of the context of teaching and learning and into assessment work that we were doing on the ground. We um, have, I think, a way more robust and engaged and an emergent uh, sort of co-created assessment process in our work now. And we've been able to actually use um, the, the kinds of conversations that happen at, at these sorts of conferences and um, the work that you all do to share out and lift up stories um, to push back on some of those funder expectations around theories of change and, and expected outcomes and move toward um, a conversation with our funders uh, where we're able to, to sort of like have a more emergent and co-created relationship with the folks that we're serving, which feels like small steps <laughs> in a long, slow process of kind of turning that technocratic assessment approach around. So um, I'll just stop there because I know we're really short on time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Brandon. I feel like we got quite a, a few notes of hope uh, throughout this discussion today. I hope you're feeling as excited as I am and I know our apps team is. 
please, if you're interested in uh, continuing the discussion, sign up for our uh, Slack feed um, to have more discussions online. Please um, share your email for future discussions. But right now I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, colleague, Anna, to um, close us out with a beautiful poem that connects to what we discussed today. Imagine the Angels of Bread by Martin Espada. This is the year that squatters evict landlords, gazing like admirals from the rail of the roof deck or levitating hands in praise of steam in the shower. This is the year that shawled refugees deport judges who stare at the floor and their swollen feet as files are stamped with their destination. This is the year that police revolvers stove hot blister the fingers of raging cops and nightsticks splinter in their palms. This is the year that dark skinned men lynched a century ago returned to sip coffee quietly with the apologizing descendants of their executioners. This is the year that those who swim the borders undertow and shiver in boxcars are greeted with trumpets and drums at the first railroad crossing on the other side. This is the year that the hands pulling tomatoes from the vine uproot the deed to the earth that sprouts the vine. The hands canning tomatoes are named in the will that owns the bedlam of the cannery. This is the year that the eyes stinging from the poison that purifies toilets awaken at last to the sight of a rooster loud hillside, pilgrimage of immigrant birth. This is the year that cockroaches become extinct, that no doctor finds a roach embedded in the ear of an infant. This is the year that the food stamps of adolescent mothers are auctioned like gold doubloons and no coin is given to buy machetes for the next bouquet of severed heads in coffee plantation country. If the abolition of slave manacles began as a vision of hands without manacles, then this is the year. If the shutdown of extermination camps began as imagination of a land without barbed wire or the crematorium, then this is the year. If every rebellion begins with the idea that conquerors on horseback are not many legged gods, that they too drown if plunged in the river, then this is the year. So may every humiliated mouth, teeth like desecrated headstones, fill with the angels of bread. Thank you so much, Anna. So I think we've reached the end of our time together, unfortunately, today. I'm gonna, I accidentally um, popped out of the screen sharing, but I, I wanna make sure that everybody has access um, to our site. We have the paper available. We're gonna make the chat available. If you've left your email address with us, we, we're gonna follow up right afterwards. Um, does anybody have anything for the good of the order before we wrap up? Um, I will just chime in and say I've created a, a mural space where folks can add any comments or thoughts for the presenters or um, and we can move our closing reflection there since we're out of time. So those questions are there and I'll post it into the chat again. Thank you so much, Julia. And thank you, everyone. I, this was such a wonderful discussion. I, I got a lot out of it. I hope that you all did as well. Um, please stay in touch. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to gracefully exit a Zoom call. So <laughs> somebody else will have to do that. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, all.